right, everyone, thank you for joining us for making digital content accessible and inclusive. We have our speakers, Hannah and Jim, here to get us going. Um, we do ask that we you keep yourself on mute and just message the chat if you need anything. Otherwise, we'll let you take it away, Hannah and Jim. Great, thank you so much for having us here today. Um, I'd like to especially thank you for the Learning Lab. This is actually our second time presenting with them. So we're really excited. Hey. Mark, get back in your class. Sarah yeah, mentioned if you can put yourself on mute, that'd be super helpful. And then we can all hear the video from the demos today. So my name is Hannah Wente and I'm the Communications Director for the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. And I am Jim Dunham. I am the Access Technology Specialist, also with the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. So welcome. Glad to have you all here. Yeah, so before we get started with the content today, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our organization. So at the council, we promote the dignity and empowerment of people in Wisconsin with high vision impaired. And we do that through advocacy efforts, both with legislators and also with people with staff and helping them advocate about And then we also do predictions. So we offer low vision evaluations, uh, vision rehabilitation services, and then we also do education, so presentations like this, and Jim does a monthly accessible technology class that's offered for free currently remotely um, through our website. So we were founded in 1952, and we were founded originally by people who are blind and visually impaired. We're still governed to this day. Um, our board is largely made up of people who are blind or visually impaired. So we're a very inclusive organization and we work to really um, model um, what inclusivity and accessibility looks like for other groups. So we have our first poll today and because we're from Wisconsin, I know not all of you are obviously from our state, but you can guess how many people in Wisconsin are blind or visually impaired. The options are A, 25%, or sorry, A, 25,000, um, B, 50,000, C, 75,000, and D, 100,000. You'll see that poll come up on your screen, so just select um, what you what you think. It's uh, winging it, actually. I'll use that term. So it looks like we have some answers in. It looks like the most popular is 75,000. According to our Department of Health Services, it's actually 100,000 people, potentially more, and that number is expected to double over the next um, few years as the population ages. So thank you for filling out that first poll. Um, I can share the results with you. And we'll go on to our next poll, which is how many um, people do you think are I don't, hang on, <laughs> I'm a little behind here. How many people do you think are unemployed? Um, and this is a national number. What's the unemployment rate of people who are blind or visually impaired? A, 30%, B, 50%, C, 70%, or D, 90%? So numbers are coming in. It looks like everyone or the majority are picking 70%, that is correct. Um, that is according to US Census data, partially due to transportation issues, hiring discrimination, um, access to technology at work. Um, I'm gonna share the results with everyone so you can see. Um, but this is something that, you know, by offering accessible software and by um, enabling people to use it at work, that's something that, you know, you can, kind of fill that unemployment gap, potentially. Okay, so nearly everyone is impacted. So chances are you, your spouse, or a loved one will experience a vision change um, in your lifetime. So it's really important that you offer accessible content because the chances are very high that someone on your social media channels or on your website is actually um, having a vision loss issue and needing to access alt text or other things like that. So our agenda today, um, we're first going to talk about kind of how this, how this all works. You know, what is access technology, how it works, kind of, we're going to give you a technology overview. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about website accessibility and give you some quick tips 
um, that you can use for making your websites more accessible and usable uh, by individuals with disabilities. Um, what to do or not to do for each platform. So there'll be kind of, kind of some do's and don'ts uh, for each platform. Uh, we're gonna talk to you about why it matters. Why it matters, why is this important? And our challenge to you. And then at the end, we're gonna have time for questions and answers. And we're gonna have a brief activity that you can, that you can do either during the question and answer or afterwards. Um, it's totally up to you. So we've got a lot to cover today. Um, so again, thank you again for joining us. And we're gonna go into kind of how it works here. So the term access technology, or it's also called assistive technology, kind of, kind of interchangeable terms there. Uh, we're kind of transitioning to the term access technology, but um, it really is a term that kind of talks about how individuals with disabilities gain access to, inf access to information, because we all know information is really important. And um, so, you know, people who have disabilities can want to get access to information. It could be as simple as someone who has a hearing loss uh, getting a vibration when their doorbell rings. Um, that's a form of um, access technology that's providing them access, access accessing inf the information of, um, you know, someone's at your door. Um, so we're going to focus, we are the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, we're going to focus on technology for individuals who are blind and visually impaired, but just be aware that this really does impact individuals uh, with all abilities and kind of just kind of impacts everyone. So um, we're going to be fo focusing on this a little bit today, um, but the, um, there really is different things you can do. So for individuals who are blind or visually impaired, there's kind of two main ways that they would access information on a computer. Uh, individuals with low vision would access uh, screen magnification software. So it, it magnifies information on the screen. It can change the color. It can change the font. It can make the mouse pointer easier to see. Uh, it can make the text larger, makes everything on the screen larger, including the, gra the graphics and other things. So there's lots of different ways people with low vision can access. Um, you know, some people just say, well, just a bigger monitor is gonna help. Well, that's true for some individuals, but it really depends upon the eye condition and it really depends upon a number of other different factors. Um, so it, it really depends upon a number of different things. So there's no one solution for individuals with low vision to access the computer. It's not like one thing works for somebody, it's not gonna, it might work for someone else, but it might not. So there really is a number of different solutions. Um, for individuals such as myself who really have no usable vision, you can make the screen as big as you want and make the colors as bold as you want, and I'm still not gonna be able to see it. So I have no usable vision. So I'm using something called screen reading software. This is software um, that reads information on the screen in synthetic speech. Um, so for example, I'm moving through the Zoom meeting right now and my headphones, I'm hearing different aspects of the Zoom meeting. I go through the participant list, I can hear the participants' names read using synthetic speech. And we're gonna see an example of that in a little bit. Um, one of the really nice things is that some of this technology is built right into your operating system. Um, the operating system manufacturers like Microsoft Windows and Apple and Mac have done some really nice things to include some of this technology built right into, into the, the operating system. That's not the only solution. There are other solutions out there commercially available, um, but it also is, is one of the solutions that you can access because it's probably on your computer. Uh, for example, in Windows, you've got a built-in screen magnifier. You go, if you go into the uh, usability settings with Windows key plus U, um, you can access the, the screen magnifier. It's built right into Windows. Uh, you've also got something called Narrator, um, which you, it's a built-in screen reader. So if you push Control, Windows plus Enter, your computer will start, will start speaking to you. Um, so it's kind of a neat thing that you can do. Um, it's built right into the operating system. The Macintosh has similar things. It's got a magnifier built into the Mac. Um, it also has a screener called VoiceOver that's built into the Mac, Mac operating system. So these are free tools that individuals who have a hard time seeing the screen or maybe cannot see the screen at all can use to access information. Um, so we'll talk about more about how to use these tools to test your content a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but also be aware that these tools are available on mobile devices as well. So if you have an Android phone or an iPhone, um, these tools are available as well. So you have a screen magnifiers in both Android and, and iPhone. Um, and you also have um, screen readers built into both the um, Android phone and on the iPhone. So I'm gonna give you a quick example and show you how a screen reader on an Apple iPhone works. So, um, so I'm 
Go ahead and share my screen here real quick. Menu, stop, share, left, there, hold, plus, right, there, button. Okay, so. 1111 AM, control center, air flight screen mirroring. I am now with the light. Screen mirroring, chance out, zoom gen. Fuck, zoom gen. Okay. So if the technology works, we should share here in a second. Leaving menus, air render. Zoom gemmed, button, selected. There we go. Zoom gemmed, button. Calendar, Wednesday, January 27th. So you're hearing the screen reader read information out loud right now. Um, it's reading as, as I'm doing different gestures on the face of the phone. So as you would, you know, on an iPhone, generally you're gonna, just going to touch an icon and you're going to go into that particular app. And if I touch an icon, it's just going to tell me what icon I'm touching. Maybe. Voice over on there we go. calendar, Wednesday, App Store. TV. Okay, so it's just telling me the names of the icons as I'm, as I'm touching them. So I'm just, you know, I'm hearing the name icon. I'm not actually going into it because I don't know what I'm, it's like I'm touching. So, for example, if I touch weather. Weather. Okay, I hear, I hear the word weather. If I want to go into weather, I'm going to double tap on the screen. Weather. Fitchburg. Sunny. Seven degrees. Fitchburg. Sunny. 19 degrees. Okay, it's a whole 19 degrees outside right now. So you hear the voiceover read that. I can perform different gestures to move through the, the elements and kind of get that information right aloud to me. Hourly forecasts. Now, 12 p.m., mostly clear, 19 degrees. Okay, so I can move through that and access that information and get that information as, as, I, as needed. Weather, app so store, this eight is, updates this, available. This works great for lots of different things. Um, if I try and access something like a website that doesn't work real well, um, I'm going to get a lot of garbage though. This, this works great for things that are made to be accessible. Um, but if we'll talk about alt tags in a little bit, but if I try and access something um, that's not, um, you know, designed to be accessible, if it's just an image, uh, it's not going to read that information. It's just going to give me a bunch of gibberish. Um, so Media controls. Menu. Stop, share, left, there, plus, right, there, button. that might be a, that might be problematic. So that can be, cause real problems for, for, for things that are not designed to be accessible for individuals with disabilities. Space, leaving menu. Um, so there are good sites and there are bad sites. Um, and, you know, websites, some of them are more accessible than others. And um, so we have a set of guidelines, the web, web content accessibility web guidelines. guidelines. And these are a set of guidelines that have been set, set up that um, really, you know, help guide, provide guidance. They're not necessarily rules, but they provide guidance on how you can make your websites more accessible. Um, and there's, there's really four major categories to these guidelines, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And perceivable is, you know, can an individual with disability perceive the information? Can they really get um, that information? Can, can they, they perceive what it is that you're looking at? So um, a good example of perceivable is, if you have a picture on your website, you really need to add alternative text because a screen reader like VoiceOver or Narrator or those different screen readers can't look at that image and tell you what that image is. It has to have a description of what that image is. So, you know, if I arrow over that, that image and I just hear graphic, I don't have no idea what, what it is that I'm, that I'm getting at here. I don't have no idea what that graphic is. But if it says graphic man holding a banana, um, you know, then I have it. Okay, it's a guy holding a banana. Then that that makes sense. So that's really perceivable. Because then I, can I perceive and understand what that what that is? Um, operable. Uh, can your controls be operated with a keyboard? Um, as you can see, I was performing different gestures there on my phone. Uh, when I use the computer, I don't use a mouse. I use everything with a keyboard. And that's just individuals who use screen readers, that's how generally how they operate. Uh, individuals with other disabilities uh, might use other types of in input technology. So. You really need to make sure that your controls are operable with something besides just a mouse. Um, so can you operate them with a keyboard? Can you control them, you know, just by pushing the tab and the arrow keys and things like that? So are they operable? Um, 
understandable. You know, is your content understandable to everyone? Can you understand things? Um, and there's a couple of good examples there. Uh, one of the ones I like to use is, is you know, uh, what are you communicating with color? Um, so, you know, is, if it says, uh, fill in the fields in blue. Well, okay, well, using a screener, I might not necessarily know what fields are in blue. So, you know, I need to really be able to understand this content needs to be understandable and really understand what, what it is that I'm literally looking to, to access. So maybe you indicate that with something else like a star or something else. And then robust just means that, you know, different people are using different types of technology to access your website. You know, people might use different browsers. They might not all be using Google Chrome. Some people might be using Firefox. Some people might be using uh, Edge. Some people might be using Internet Explorer. Um, they might not be using the most current version. Um, so you, because that's what works best with their access technology. So really we need to make sure your tech, your website is robust and can work with a number of different, you know, some people say, oh, it works perfect if you use Google Chrome and you stand on your head and it's Tuesday at 3.30. Well, no, it does, you know, you need to make sure that it works for a number of different users and a number of different conditions. So, um, so our next slide is just some top 10 tips. Um, these are just some things you, things you can do to make your website uh, accessible um, and, and usable. Um, and we kind of already with some of like, include alt text. That's a very important thing. Um, links have descriptive names. So as a screen reader user, one of the things that I might be doing is getting a list of links on a page. So if I'm just, you know, if I'm quickly browsing, you know, because I don't want to read every single piece of text on your, on your web page. Um, and visually, you don't do that either. Visually, when you read your web page, you're reading, you know, just kind of glancing through the, cause the most important things. So I'm doing the same thing when I'm using a screen reader. I'm just getting sometimes just a list of links because I know, hey, there's a great link on this web page that I want that I want to access, and I just want to list the links on this page. So um, you know, but if I if I look at your list of links and the link text just says click here, I have no idea where that link is going to take me. Um, but if it says you know click here to access our contact information, um, first of all, click here shouldn't be used because click here is kind of text that's text that's indicating you, you have to use a mouse. So um, go here to access your contact information or go here to access our latest news. That way, if I see just a list of links, I can say, go here to access our latest news. Okay, I know what I'm gonna be going to if I activate this, activate this link. So um, it's just a really important thing to think about when you're putting in your link text. And it's a really simple thing to do uh, when you're designing a site. Um, so use color with care. We talked about that. Make sure you're not communicating things exclusively with color. Um, Content with a keyboard, you know, make sure you can access things. You tab, you know, try tri tabbing through your website. Um, try using the different controls. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the other ones we have here is, is a little bit of lingo. It's called ARIA. And our ARIA is Accessible Rich Internet Applications. It's just a uh, web con for a tool for web content, uh, web applications, particularly people who use JavaScript uh, to make websites more accessible. So if you see the word um, ARIA, um, it's not talking about something with related to music. It's talking in this case about uh, accessible, rich internet applications. So just to define that term and what that term means. And Ken's gonna talk about alt text. Yeah, so writing alt text, we talked about how important it is to provide alt text both on websites is also great for social media as well. So we're actually going to show you how to add it to social media posts. But what we usually focus on is instead of describing what the person is wearing or what they look like, um, we really just describe what the person is doing. Um, only things that are kind of relevant to understanding what is happening in the photo. So um, anything that kind of changes the meaning of written content or adds to the meaning of written content is what you want to write alt text for. So typically if I have like icons on a site and they're not really adding to the meaning of the content, I won't do alt text for those. Um, but if it's something like Jim was talking about, you know, a photo of the man holding a banana and you're working for Chiquita Bananas or something, then that's an important thing to describe. Um, so here's an example. This is on the right hand side. Obviously, we're all in Zoom meetings all the time now. This is actually our scholarship and awards event. 
And the alt text that I wrote for this was a group of eight scholarship recipients and two council board members on a Zoom call. And then you get an idea of, okay, their faces in the photo and um, you kind of know who people are in the photo. So on Facebook, they don't give you a great way of kind of creating alt text. So what I've been doing for the past year or so is actually writing out photo colon and then writing my alt text right in the post. So you can see the post on the right, I have, um, there's our executive director and then a reporter in the studio. And I say, you know, who's in the studio on the table, there's a microphone um, in the background, there's speakers and sound equipment. If it's a graphic, I put graphic colon and describe what's happening in that graphic so that people know, okay, this is an infographic about X, Y, Z. And then um, you can actually go back in after you post. So this is all kind of when you're scheduling it, but you can go in after you post and I'm gonna show you how to do that. Okay, one second. Let's see, stop share. So if you wanna go into a post that you've already done and change the alt text, Facebook has been getting better about um, guessing what photos are based on AI, artificial intelligence. Um, you can also go in and override that. So when you go to, I'm in a photo that I had with a post, you're gonna to go to these three dots at the upper right hand corner. And the third option down is change alt text. It's gonna pull up a box that says, this is what we automatically generated. And they said, this may be an, an image of one person and a pet. I'm gonna write in here, this is a woman standing with her service dog. So you can actually go in and override that alt text. Now that's saved with that photo. So when someone with a screen reader accesses this post, they can read both the post text and that um, text that I just put in. And then I also have it, or I should have it in the post text itself if I'm scheduling it in advance. So that's um, just a good trick for changing your alt text. Let me get back to our PowerPoint here. Yeah, so this is a video. We were really excited when um, this video came out. This is a local health system that's in our state. And they had this great video of someone who is visually impaired going skydiving. And we're gonna show you that um, video. Do something totally new to me. Never done it before in my life. I've always kind of had dreams about doing it. Oh, as a person who's blind, there's no way of knowing what's ha what's happening in that video. There's no way of, of you know he's talking about what he's what he's doing. And he's doing it. We don't know if, know if he's making cookies or if he's what he's doing there. Obviously, he's he's jumping out of a plane, um, but there's no description there to know really what's happening and, and to, to understand what's going on. So, including some sort of description, even if it's a, just a verbal description in your in your, your video is really really important. Yeah, so we have a better example that I'll share next of kind of what a video should look like and should uh, sound like as well. From the creators of Tangle and Wreck-It Ralph, Disney. A carrot-nosed co-lined snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Ooh, hello. <laughs> he takes a deep sniff. His nose lands on a frozen pond. A reindeer looks up and pants like a dog. <gasps> Seeing the reindeer slip on the ice, the snowman smiles and moves towards him, though actually he's running on the spot. The reindeer falls on his chin. The snowman uses his arm as a crutch. The reindeer paddles his front legs. Head over heels, the snowman crawls along the ice. The reindeer does the breaststroke. The snowman rolls his body but flips onto his back. The reindeer's tongue sticks to the ice. <laughs> 
Snowman holds his head, twig arm and reindeer lips, tug at the carrot. The carrot flies off oh. the land, soft snow. <laughs> So that, that's a, re a really, really fun video and a really kind of fun way of, you know, obviously your videos probably aren't going to have noses falling on frozen ponds, um, but that, that's audio description, kind of you know, describing what's going on, describing the action. That's kind of a track that was added afterwards that kind of describes what's happening in the video. So even if you can't do that, even if you don't have that audio description, maybe just have some verbal clues rather than saying, hey, I'm going over here, rather than saying, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into the house now or something like that. You kind of just describe what's going on uh, with your narrative and with your description, uh, what's, what's, what's happening. And it's best to do that. So, you know, I've done a lot of videos and you're writing a script and you're including the scene in that script already. So that's really the best place to record those audio descriptions because you're already writing that when you're doing a video shoot. So um, just keeping that in mind throughout the whole process instead of trying to add them on later. Obviously, it's a lot tougher to add an audio track later on. Um, next, we're going to talk about Instagram. I hope that a lot of people on the call use Instagram on a regular basis. It's obviously a large kind of growing platform. Um, on the left-hand side, we have an example of a bad post, which is literally, um, it looks like it's a video of a backpack, and this is a mall kind of in our area. And it says, this is summer in a bag. And if you were visually impaired and don't have the alt text to go with that, you have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so we have a better example on the right hand side, which talks about accessible voting and different ballots. And I've said, you know, this is a graphic, it's a black and white graphic of what type of ba ballot would you like, large print braille, audio assistance. So really just, again, building in the alt text into the post is really important. So um, Instagram is one where you can't schedule the alt text ahead of time, similar to Facebook. So it's kind of a bummer because you have to go in afterward and add it in, or you need to just really build it into the post so that people understand what your um, photo content is saying. And then for Twitter, um, so obviously people love using GIFs. GIFs are not accessible. You have to describe those, um, describe what's happening. And our rule of thumb is really that we try to keep pictures in the kind of photo box and words in the word box, if that makes sense. So it's not really helpful to have a graphic that has tons of text on it that's really popular um, for promoting events and things like that. It's really better to kind of keep those separate and have, you know, just a photo in the photo spot and a word in the word spot. Um, but here um, with Twitter, they actually really prompt you to add alt text. So it's really great when you're scheduling in Hootsuite or a different scheduling platform, or if you are posting natively to Twitter, they really say, what do you want the alt text to be for this? So it's nice that it's there kind of front and center as a reminder. And I've shown um, kind of in the, the right hand side photo here, what it looks like when you're adding in that description. And then once you do a tweet that has alt text, it actually adds a little icon on the bottom left corner that says ALT. So people know that that has alt text with it. So <clears throat> we're looking at how to, how to check these, how to, how to check it. Um, so one of the things you can do, because we, I mentioned earlier, you have these built-in access technology applications that's built right into whatever operating system you're using. There's different ways you can do to kind of check those and kind of check your, um, you know, is your alt text working? Is it, is it reading properly? Um, can I operate this with just a keyboard? So there's different things you can do. Um, so this is something you can do, you know, if you're using a mobile device or if you're using um, a desktop uh, or a laptop, it's really easy to do. So um, for an iPhone, um, if you want to check some of the accessibility things, there are lots of accessibility settings built into your iPhone. If you go to settings and you go to accessibility, um, you'll find just a number of different things that you'll find the voice over screen reader you can turn on. You can turn on a magnifier. You can turn on a couple other different things. Um, on talk on uh, Android, you can activate TalkBack by going to Settings, Accessibility again. Um, and there's options there for TalkBack. There's also an option for a screen magnifier. Um, if you're on a Mac, you can push Command F5 uh, and make your Mac start talking. It's kind of a fun trick to, to move around. And then you can kind of tab through your website, move around. Um, there's other different keys you can use to move to the website. Use your arrow keys to kind of move to the website and just see what it reads, see how, how it works. Um, now, you don't have to be an expert user of this to kind of just check it out. 
Um, those of us who are using it on a regular basis, we kind of know some tip, tips and tricks to moving through the website a lot quicker. Um, but you don't have to be an expert just to kind of check it out. Uh, Windows, we mentioned Windows Narrator. You can do Control, Windows, Enter, and turn that on. It also turns it off because it's also very important to know how to turn this stuff off once you turn it on. So Command F5 will turn your you know, voiceover off on the on the Mac as well. So these are, all, these are all toggles that just push it once, it turns it on, push it again, it turns it off. So, you know, you don't want your computer talking constantly. Yeah, I'll just add that for testing like things like e-newsletters and websites, I do, you know, hey Siri, turn voiceover on. And that's just mm -hmm. a really easy way to get it on and then turn it off as well. Yeah, yeah Siri Siri's your friend. Siri definitely will turn that on as well. So yes, absolutely, yes. So why does this matter? You know, why take the time to do, you know, adding alt text and doing all this kind of stuff? It's an extra step. Why does it really matter? Why should you take these steps? And, you know, if you're doing social media to engage people, um, making your content and your posts more accessible to everyone um, helps everyone to engage. So, you know, you might have someone who's using a screen or someone who's using a screen magnifier, look at your post. And if, if they can access that content, they can say, oh, wow, I didn't know about that. And they can, maybe they can, maybe they'll pass in some information on, or maybe they'll retweet it with some additional information, or maybe they'll forward on to their friends. Um, and, you know, social media is trend driven. So if you do it, um, you know, you're setting an example for others. So those people might say, oh yeah, that's that, that really cool organization. They're including lots of alt text and they're doing some really cool things. We should start doing that too. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's really trend driven. So kind of just, you know, be a leader and don't just be a follower. Um, don't wait until you get a complaint. Um, you know, be proactive um, because those of us who use this technology um, we do, um, we do complain because if I'm accessing, trying to access a site, particularly if it's a site that I'm trying to buy something from, or I really need some information from, and that site's not accessible, I'm going to probably complain. I'm going to, you know, a good example is, um, we are working with the disability, um, Wisconsin commission for voting, and they had some, some pages that were not really accessible. I was trying to perform some stuff on their website and it didn't work so well. So I wrote them a letter and they, they fixed it. Um, Wisconsin Elections Commission, and they they fixed it and made it much better. And you know, in addition to complaining, I also applaud them when they do something right. Write to them and say, "Hey, this works really well. I really like how this works." So that's a really important thing as well. So really encourage you to be proactive, to set your trends, and to and to get out there and engage and be a, a leader in this. In this. So our challenge to you is to try this out. You know, you not, might not be perfect the first time. Don't let the, you know, perfect stand in the way of the good. You know, give this a try. You know, try putting, adding some alt text. Try incorporating some of these accessibility features. Try doing some of this stuff. Um, and, you know, give it a try. Play with it a little bit. See what, what, what options you have. Um, you're not going to be perfect. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody, hey, this alt text doesn't really, doesn't really, doesn't really describe what's going on here. Or then this kind of stuff takes practice. It's not something you're going to get right away. Um, so we really encourage you in February, um, which is coming up in what, less than a week, um, to kind of practice this. Um, you know, maybe amend your social media policy if you have a social media policy. Um, you know, look at that social media policy and talk to others in your organization about how you can amend your social media policy to make this more accessible, to add accessibility um, to your social media and maybe make it part of your practice that you're, this is something you're gonna do going forward. Um, and so we've got a pivot day for you. Of, it's kind of just a goal, just kind of a day of, hey, here's what I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start making sure that all my, all my social media and all my web content is accessible. Uh, it's March 10th. And why we picked March 10th, it's um, National Be Awesome Day. And so we want you to be awesome. We want you to do good things and we want you to go forward and, and really make this content uh, accessible and usable uh, for everyone. And, and just think about all your, all your users who possibly might be accessing this content because you don't know who's accessing your website. Um, you don't know who's, who's looking at your, you know, your social media posts. Um, they might be using a screen reader. You don't know. They might be using a screen magnifier. You, you just don't know. Um, so it, it's really important to just, you know, put your content out there, make it inclusive, 
um, and make it so that everyone can access the information because you've got a lot of great information. You've got a lot of great things that you're sharing. And, you know, the web is, is very, very, can be a very inclusive place. Um, you know, as a person who's blind, there's so much different things that I can do out there now on the web. I can go out and I can buy things from Amazon, from my computer, and I can research and find out, you know, football statistics. And there's so many different things that I can do um, and access information just as anybody else would access information. So the web can really be a great playing field to level access, um, but it can only be as level if, the, if things are fully accessible and usable. So we encourage you to follow us and, and look at our website. Our website at the Wisconsin Council of the Blind is wcblind.org, uh, wcblind.org. So we encourage you to check out our website. Uh, we are on uh, social media posts. We're on Facebook um, and at the Council WI and on uh, Twitter is at the Council WI. Um, and we just, you know, Kind of relaunched our website um, about a, what a year and a half ago now, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and we're using accessible CMS, so um, uh, we're actually using WordPress to make our website fully accessible and usable. So if you're looking for an example of a website that's accessible, uh, check out our site. There's a couple other sites we can recommend that are you know fully example. Because if you're saying, "Hey, I want to do this on a website. I really want to make this part of my website accessible, but I'm not sure how to do it." You know, you can always find examples. The great, the web has lots of examples for different things. So um, check out our website. There's other websites out there that are, that are fully accessible and fully usable. Um, so, you know, you can follow by example sometimes too, if you don't quite know how to do it. Um, and you can always contact us with questions. Both Hannah and I are always happy to answer questions. You can contact us with social media. Uh, and I believe our contact information is also in the handout. Um, and we'd be happy to answer questions and help you help you along. So um, with that, we've got probably open up to questions. Yeah, we've got about nine minutes for questions. So definitely if you have questions, feel free to put those in the chat. Hopefully Sarah can read them for us because I don't have the chat up right now. But while we're taking questions, I would love for you to try to mm -hmm. modify a post that you have already have out on social media or review a web page that is on your website or create a new post that is accessible. So identify what changes you need to make to your kind of regular routine to make content accessible or just start from scratch right now and um, create a post that has alt text. Um, you could take a screenshot of this talk, for example, and say, this is the screenshot of PowerPoint and people on Zoom. And then feel free to take us at um, the Council WI on Twitter, at WC Blind on Instagram and Facebook. You can also take the Nonprofit Learning Lab. I'm sure they would love that. Um, but yeah, we wanted you to just be able to try it out and questions may arise as you are trying this activity too. So Sarah, any questions for us so far? Yeah, we just got one in um, from Annabelle that says, I'm currently revamping our website. Is, uh, so this is something great to integrate. Oh, never mind. It wasn't a question. It was just a thank you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> yeah, oh, here we go. All right. Um, it says, what would you recommend for YouTube? Describing the video in the description or do they even have an accessibility feature? Yeah, so what I do for YouTube, actually, I don't know if you are making the videos yourself, um, like in iMovie or something, but iMovie makes it really easy to add voiceover, which is the same as audio descriptions, um, you know, in the sense of like technical aspect. So when you're creating the video and editing the video, um, you can go through and just record the audio descriptions in between dialogue, right? So you're setting the scene, like here we are, at a polling place on election day and there's you know poll booths set out in the room um so you're trying to basically do audio descriptions at times when there's not dialogue going on so if you remember that kind of um frozen example they had dialogue between olaf and oh my gosh the reindeer <laughs> Is the ranger Olaf? I can't remember. It's been a long time, but um, <laughs> basically they were able to have some sort of like sounds and dialogue going on between them, but then also the description. So then that's going to get built into your MP4 file and you can upload that to YouTube. But yeah, they don't make, make it very easy. Like once it's up on YouTube, you could write descriptions into the like physical description itself. But the best thing to do is to add the audio file 
before it even goes on to YouTube. So hopefully that helps. We've got another one that says, my goal for this year is to update our lib guidelines and be more ADA compliant. It's a big task, but well worth it. Uh, oh, hold on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, that's okay. um, I was wondering how hashtags are factored in with regards to adding accessibility. When I post content on Facebook and Instagram, I use hashtags in the caption, but I was wondering if this is disruptive in terms of accessibility and if I should have more hashtags to the comments, um, let's see, hold on. comment section instead. So one thing with hashtags, we I think we forgot to mention this earlier, is to use something called camel case. <clears throat> and camel case simply means um, capitalizing the first letter of each word in a hashtag. Um, because if you have a hashtag of, um, you know, let's just say today is Wednesday. So the hashtag of today is Wednesday and you run that all together, um, a screener user is going to get literally going to get today's Wednesday, like all run together. And it just, you, you listen to that. It's like, what is that? Like if you, if you looked at a word and it was all run together with no spaces, no capitalists, you might have a really hard time sometimes distinguishing what that is. And if you listen to it, it's going to be even more difficult. Or if you capitalize the T of today and the I is of is and W is Wednesday uh, or W of Wednesday, you're going to get today is Wednesday. It's going to read it out much better. So using that, that uppercase on the first letter of every word and hashtag is really important. And it really just a quick, and easy thing to do to make your hashtags much more accessible and usable uh, by individuals using access technology. Mm -hmm. And I would use only like three to five hashtags. I think any more than mm -hmm. that, that's a lot to listen to for a screen okay. reader. Yes. Um, and then if you're doing that, you know, what I talked about with the photo colon or graphic colon in Facebook, make sure that's above the hashtags because that's kind of vital to the post. That's providing alt text and context for the post. And then the hashtags go below that. Um, what are good resources to keep up with best practices to make content accessible? Yeah, great question. They So you should be getting a handout later today that has some good examples. I don't know if you, Jim, know of any. I know like Facebook has an accessibility team, so you can follow their news mm -hmm. uh, their Twitter account as well. So they'll post updates on what they're doing. Right. And also, you know, the, the, the web content accessibility guidelines, W3C, um, they always, they're always up to have newsletters and different things. Um, and there are other different organizations that are out there. Like I say, you can look and find different resources for uh, web accessibility. Um, and there's, there's lots, it's, it's a very active field. There's lots of new things that are, that are happening out there these days. Um, so, you know, definitely check out some of the handouts, some of the resources in our handout. Um, is it better to build the text into a post or write alt text specifically? I could go either way. Jim, do you have a preference in terms of reading? I do it differently based on the platform and what they allow me to do, but I try to provide the context in the post text itself as much as I can, just so it's all yeah. built in. I, th yeah, I, th I think it's much better to have it in the post because sometimes like, if I hear graphic, I'm just going to ignore the graphic or go by it, move by it. So if it's in the actual post itself, um, you're definitely going to get it. And it's not bad to do both. I mean, if you, you're not, I'd much rather get description twice than not get description at all. So, you know, it's not a bad thing if you put the alt text on and also put the same information in the post. It's, it's not a bad thing to double up with that. You're never going to get somebody complaining, oh, there's too much alt text and people aren't going to complain about that. So um, if you want to do both, it's not a bad thing. But I would say the primary would say in the post. Um, how does this apply to databases? I'm about to start my first SQL project. Is that something I would need to code in or will it be ready by the voiceover via the browser? Or will it be read by the voiceover via the browser? Well, I would just say that make sure that your <clears throat> interface, that your, your browser interface is accessible, uh, is, is navigable with the keyboard. Uh, when you're talking about those kind of things, you're talking about some other interfaces that you might not necessarily have control over. Um, <clears throat> so just, you know, I would say test this kind of thing. If you're using SQL, you know, test it out. If once it's on the web, you know, can it be accessed with a screen reader? You know, try these things out. Does, does it work? Um, and if it doesn't, you know, maybe write to the individual who's providing you the interface and say, hey, I've got users with disabilities who are trying to access this and this, this part of it they're not able to access. So it, sometimes you, sometimes some things you can control and sometimes you cannot control. And when there's things that you cannot control, you need to contact the people who can control them and say, hey, we've got individuals trying to access this who cannot access this content. So I would say test, test and keep testing this. And as you're building your database, as you're doing different things, 
um, you know, databases are, there's, there's not really, you're not generally writing a cut of code, you're compiling data and, and you know, putting different things in. Um, so, um, you know, the big thing is, is keyboard access. Can it be accessed with a keyboard? Can a person navigating who's not using a mouse? Um, but some of that you have control over and some of you don't. Um, I tried to edit a post on my phone with alt text on Facebook, but the option isn't there. Is this only there if you used a desktop? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I think it depends probably on what phone you have as well. I haven't done it on my phone, but yeah, I'm on a, a laptop right now and it's working on a laptop. It used to be in the lower right of the photo. So you could try there as well, where it says like, um, edit photo or, you know, with the tag options, just look for that change alt text options. Otherwise just edit post and you could add in photo colon or graphic colon into the post text. Um, and then on a note for YouTube, would you recommend making a separate video then with a voiceover and one without? Yeah, we try to stay away from separate videos. We work with the Wisconsin Disability Vote Coalition. So if you're looking for good examples for YouTube specifically, they have some good examples of both um, non-audio uh, described and audio described side by side. So you can kind of see those differences. But we really strive to make it just one video because otherwise it's separate. It feels like a separate experience, right? And like you created this separate thing for the group of people with disabilities. So we try to stay away from having a separate video. I would say if you're doing it retroactively, that might be what you have to do is create another video. But um, ideally you just work it into new videos that you're doing in the future and make it all part of one process. And a good way to think about that is, you know, if, if a website had a video for people who were under 5'8 and the people who were over 5'8, how strange would that be? It would be like, okay, you people under 5'8, you access this video. People over 5'8, you access this video. And people would be like, well, am I getting the, am I getting the stuff? You know, people who are under 5'8, am I getting the stuff that the taller video people are getting, you know? And so you, you, you just wouldn't be sure. So it's the same kind of thing. So when you have two videos, you know, they don't necessarily know um, does the video have the same content? Are they, are they up if you update one video, is the second video getting updated as well? So, so we really, you know, we really, really promote inclusivity and, and really making sure we're including everyone in the same content. So we really want to make sure that you have one video, if at all possible, having one video that has all the features in it. Mm -hmm. um, are there any good ally type groups we can join to help advocate for access? Um, any good advocate groups? That, um, again, I think there's a couple different resources in your handout that might be really useful. Um, you can kind of look at some of the different links that are in, in that handout. Um, I think that might be it for now, unless anybody else has anything that they want to pop into the chat that I may have missed early on. Oh, here we go. Um, the place I work has been slowly working to make a lot of resources more accessible, both online and offline. But there's been some questions about the time and energy staff would have to spend. Do you have any advice on how to reassure people that this isn't a huge demand to ask? I, I think about, so I've been in communications for almost a decade and alt text was not on my radar prior to working at the council. So it's something I've definitely had to build into my um, just work it's really not that much more time and you really get a process down in terms of adding alt text or changing font sizes so that they're larger or working to make you know, different versions of documents or um, you know, making sure stuff is in Word instead of PDFs, not using tables, things like that. So there's, there's a lot that you can do and it might seem overwhelming at first, but eventually it just becomes second nature and it really is um, you know, streamlined into your in your work plan. And it's so important if you can create inclusivity and model it for people. And you just never know, you know, who you're excluding until you make that content accessible and you bring new people to the table for your organization or your business. So I think it's absolutely worth, you know, any amount of effort. And I'll say that the, you get used to it and it really is not a ton of extra work. Um, it says, I think this was a question earlier, but would you recommend alt text editing over posting the photo caption at the end of a post in advance? 
Yeah, I think it's up to you again with your workflow, like how likely are you to go back in right after it's posted? I mean, most of my posts run at night, you know, so I'm not like online at 8 p.m. like going back in and editing our alt text, which is why I write our Facebook alt text into the post itself. But it really depends on the channel. Obviously for Twitter, it's you can schedule it ahead of time, so that's no problem. Um, you don't need to write it separately, but I would just think about what works best for you and what will get you to the same result. So it's really up to you and how you work. But we talked about the importance of really including it in the post text. And if you don't want the pressure of going back in and, and changing alt text on all of your posts, then I would just you know write it into the post text itself. Um, that might be it. Well, again, thank you all of you for your time and, you know, taking the day to learn about accessibility. It's, I'm thrilled that so many of you are coming to this presentation. Hannah and I, you know, love doing these presentations. We, we love it when you guys come and want to learn about this kind of stuff and want to make your content more accessible and more usable. So um, thank you for your time and attending this presentation. Yes, thank you, everyone. Take care.